What's a virtue? Patience. Yeah, sometimes the cows don't know, aren't in on a get it. Hello, ladies. So what are we doing to these ladies today? Prank testing. Yay, testing. Yay we're prank testing. Why are we prank testing them? To find to the... Find, to find empties. empties. Yeah. The dole bludgers. The girls have decided they do not want to be a part of this population any longer. So for every empty lady, that means a new home for a replacement heifer. So just like a population of wild animals, name your favorite animal species here. One mother departs and one daughter becomes a mother. That's how it works. Except for humans, we've kind of screwed that up <laughs> with our 1.04% replacement rate. Um, yeah, so that's the deal with cows. This, the carrying capacity of this property is X amount of cows. We come in every year and we preg test these lovely ladies. We find the girls that want to stay in the system, those that have decided to do the happy dance with the bull. Those that did not get pregnant, um, yeah. They go down a different value chain, having contributed to the system. And some of these lovely little female calves at foot, some of them will go on, well, next year, because the girls that are replacing them are already yearlings. But yeah, some of these, some of these female calves here will come in to replace the cows that have left the system. It's pretty cool, eh? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I reckon it's a beautiful system. It's kind of cool, like in a wild population of animals. What's your favorite animal, Courtney? Turtles. Sea turtles, perfect. Do you know how many eggs a sea turtle will lay per clutch? No, I don't. It's about 120. Wow. Do you know how many clutches they might lay in a year? Oh, is, it, is it even once a year? I think it's three, yeah. I read. Okay. That's 360 eggs. Do you know how old they have to be before they start reproducing? Ages, yeah, I don't know. I think it's 30. Uh, yeah. You know how long they can live? Yeah. yeah, like 100. So that's like 70 years of 360 eggs. What's 70 times 360? Oh, I don't know. You're the mathematician. You got a number? <laughs> we can do a ballpark. 70 times 360. Let's do 70 times 400. That makes it easy. Because we can say 7 times 4 and then just add a ton of zeros to it. 28,000 babies. Those little, those little eggs that hatch and we see those cute little sea turtles going to, heading into the ocean. It's a high how life many, baby turtle. How many of those 28,000 little baby turtles are female? Approximately. Hopefully 50 50, but I don't know. Yeah, so 14,000. Out of those 14,000 females, how many of them will drag themselves onto the beach one day? Out of these 14,000, how many of them will drag themselves up onto the beach and lay some eggs? Uh, only a small handful. How many is that in that small handful? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. On average. If the answer was 10, then the population, let's say the population of global sea turtles now was 100,000. The next year it would be a million. The year after that it would be 10 million. The year after that it would be 100 million. The year after that it would be... Let's just go one. One! One female! <laughs> one female! Wow! So see that cow there, the white one with the, with the yeah. speckles? She's a speckle park. See her little calf there? Yeah. Uh, I think it's a steer. Is it? Her little calf? Um, get out of the way, you want to see if you can. Oh no, it is a heifer, it is a heifer. It could be retained. Partly because it's pretty. <laughs> and it is a heifer, you can see it weeing behind its mother. <laughs> and it's coming out the back, not the bottom. <laughs> that's, a, that's always a good clue. Yes. Um, on average, every cow in this population will produce one daughter that gets retained. And um, all the extras, uh, what are you doing? little girl get back in the crowd we might want to retain you you can't go running off you might be a replacement female um, yeah so one one cow begets one offspring now in the sea turtle population of 14,000 eggs or sorry 14,000 eggs it produce 14,000 females and, on, and only one lives so that means 13,999 die how do they die so seagulls seagulls, Predators, seagulls. Us. stop it now <laughs> i'm walking on that beach mm -hmm. Seagull's gonna come, put me in the coconut, and they did, and they did, and I went. Have you ever seen that? Star Wars? Oh, we'll watch it later, it's awesome. 
with Yoda singing seagulls. Stop it now. Uh, Bad lip reading. It is gold. Okay. Oh, actually, I think yeah, it's hilarious. Oh man, it's piss funny. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, okay. A little bit of a side joke there. Radio. So thir thirteen thousand nine hundred ninety-nine of them die. Seagull death, starvation, predation, dehydration, run over by a redneck driving down beach. Yeah. Picked up by a person who thinks they're helping by picking them up yeah. and ends up interfering any number of ways that they go deceased. Okay, now, these girls, one cow lives, say, seven years on average. In that time, she has five calves. Out of those five calves, a little two and a half of them are, are female. Out of those two and a half females, one is kept. There's your 20% replacement rate, folks. You know, if you got 100,000 cows, you tend to keep 200 efforts. So, same deal. So, on average, you know, seven year old don't cap to their two-year-old five years five got down two and a half so yeah out of those the one female gets retained what happens to the rest of them do they die of starvation no no do they die of predation no do they die of dehydration no no they live a happy life being a cow up until the day we humanely euthanize them for the benefit of mankind that's why i love being a cow vet if i was an animal i'd want to come back as a cow not as a bull, because you only get like two to three months of fun time, and the rest of the time you're in there with a bunch of scaly mates that just want to bash you up. I want to be a cow. <laughs> Cows have got it going on. Yeah, and it's pretty wild, isn't it? So, like, people will say, oh, I don't want to eat meat because I'm taking a life. You're making a life because the carrying capacity, the size of the population of sea turtles is dictated by the size of the environment that the sea turtles can live in. The size of the cow herd is dictated by the size of the paddock. And the size of the paddock is dictated by the people that own the land, what they're going to do with it. So over there we can see canola, lovely canola, $1,000 a ton canola. That's monoculture. Man, there's only one thing in that paddock of sea of beautiful yellow flowers, and that's canola. There's a few bugs, but even those, we do everything we can to make sure it's only canola. So we use insecticides, we use herbicides, we use all sorts of stuff in there. Versus these cows, look at this stuff paddock that they came out of. This is biodiversity at its best, kids. All this green grass, all these different forbs and succulents and things like that. The, the um, kangaroos come and hop around in this a little bit and have a little bit of feed and then go and hide in the refugia, the remnant veg that's around this thing. I love cows and I love what cows do for our environment. They're a good thing. They are, yes. Because monoculture by definition excludes biodiversity. If it was me, I'd say, hold the bun. Go to McDonald's, say, hold the bun. Give me 16 meat patties. I'm trying to save the environment, save the world, and just make more cows. I'm creating life. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy world, isn't it? Crazy thing is, I believe this stuff. <laughs> but it's true. In a sense. Right on. Let's get up here to the yards. We're going to practice these ladies. And what are we going to do with the empties? We're going to send them off. We are going to send them off. So they've, they've made their contribution. They've decided not to get pregnant. They are going to go and probably get turned into what they call manufacturing beef. That's what's going to be at McDonald's. When you read and meet an angry Angus or whatever, it's generally an Angus cow. Um, the calves are generally what you find at the steakhouse and places like that. The surplus calves, which again are humanely euthanized. The, um, anything that causes them stress or discomfort is, is an anathema to the outcome, which is to produce a, a, um, a product that us humans <coughs> can enjoy as kind of, I guess you could say, our, our tax on the system. We look after them. We manage the replacement rate optimally, just like a wild population. But we look after those that aren't going to make the, that aren't going to be retained as replacements and, and they go down this alternative path, which at face value seems like a mean thing to do. But people that eat beef actually provide habitat for, for, um, for cows. The place I grew up in is Wild Horse, Colorado, and it takes about 20 to 30 acres to run a cow there. And it takes about four people to eat the progeny from a cow a year. And where I come from, the, the, the ground's either, um, the ground's either um, still in grass or it's, uh, or it's being farmed. And so those are the two options. So you've either got this big wheat field, which is quite beautiful, and look, I grow wheat as well, or you got the options of cows running around there doing what cows do. Cows do what cows love. We handle them two or three times a year. And this and that and the other. Well, I was a field herpetologist for the Division of Wildlife. My job was to drive around and look for herps, which are reptiles and amphibians, which are great indicators of environmental health. When, when you start to, when the ecosystem starts to collapse, the first thing to go is the amphibians. They just can't handle it. Um, and then the reptiles, et cetera, et cetera. And it's all that big food web. And in, the, in that grassland ecosystem of, of Eastern Colorado, uh, Western Nebraska, Eastern Wyoming, Montana, down to Oklahoma, Texas, that great big band. There was 35 million bison running up and down that thing. Whew, they'd come through them. When they didn't look like the place had been plowed. And then behind them, the antelope would come deep, bleep, 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 and they would eat the shoots, kind of like sheep in a rotational grazing system, like, you know, Alan Savory sort of stuff. Really good stuff. We came in, took over the joint, 
made a few mistakes, lots of mistakes. That country was given to my ancestors and other people's ancestors. Like we were given that country from, you know, taken away from the Native Americans at the time, given to my family in the Eastern Colorado and Wild Horse, 1909, we settled there. And it was still in grass, still is in grass. And within that grassland ecosystem, you can go out in the paddock and everything's there. The ecosystem's intact because the role of the cow has supplanted what the bison was doing, especially if you were tasting grass. You go into a wheat field and there's nothing. And as a kid, we used to play in the wheat fields and get yelled at. <laughs> But there's nothing there except mice. Yeah. You know, we've um, it's monoculture, and so I think if people actually understood that the that a, a really a good beef producer, a good rancher, whatever word you want to use for it, they're working with the environment, protecting that habitat to what it was like before, at least in eastern Colorado. And again, it takes four people to eat that cow. So if you look at it that way, and it's, let's say it takes 30 acres to run a cow there, and that means one person by giving up eating meat is potentially taking seven and a half acres of the grassland ecosystem of Eastern Colorado and saying, farm it into the ground with a big diesel huffing machine and grow wheat there, which is monoculture. Now, I'm not anti-cropping at all, but it's just understanding that because at, at a face value, we can make a lot of money selling people vegetarian or vegan surprise snacks because they're generally more expensive because people are making that decision to pay a little bit more because they think it's a better ethical decision. But really, I reckon if we could get people out here and see what we do and ride with me every day, and I often say that when I'm made a vegan on a plane or whatever, I say I invite you to come spend time with me. Because if they came out and met these people and saw how these people manage their livestock and we're out here and actually could walk through that field of canola over there, and then go walk through this field of grass, I think they'd, they'd just not just eat beef, they'd be buying it and painting their house with it and riding it to work and the whole nine. Save the world, eat more beef. Yahoo! Should I run for prime minister or something? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's preg these girls. <laughs>